White House and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are both pushing lawmakers to pass the debt ceiling deal. The House Rules Committee is voting on whether or not to send the agreement to the floor. We expect that it will. Multiple Republican members have said they do not support the bill, but if it is passed, it would suspend the debt limit for two years and temporarily cap non-defense discretionary spending. Lawmakers could vote on the deal in the House as soon as tomorrow. For more on this, Nancy Cordes and Scott McFarland join us now. Nancy is CBS News' chief White House correspondent. Scott, of course, is CBS News' congressional correspondent. Nancy, what is the feeling at the White House? Well, uh, they are dialing for dollars right now, Major. Basically, you've got uh, the entire senior leadership team making calls, reaching out to House Democrats because this bill is going to need a significant chunk of Democratic support in order to pass in the House. And that's just the first hurdle. So uh, they are talking to Democratic members who might be on the fence, who might have questions, who have concerns that the White House gave too much. Uh, the OMB director, Shalanda Young, who led the negotiations for the White House over the past couple of weeks, came out and spoke to us for the first time today. She described those calls that she's having. She said that her goal is to educate members rather than to tell them how to vote. She said in her experience that doesn't work very well, but she is running into some pushback, and that's what I asked her about today. Take a listen. The chair of the Progressive Caucus says that it's really unfortunate that you are uh, you know, expanding the, the work requirements for this particular age group. She says it's a terrible policy. I know that you've been working the phones, speaking to a number of members of, uh, I assume, the Progressive Caucus, trying to convince them that this is good policy. Is she right about that, that this is bad policy? Uh, look, I won't get into individual member opinions, because I think I... Uh, I told uh, Phil or, or someone else, my job is to tell members what's in the bill. Uh, so one of the things that is frustrating the members of the Progressive Caucus in particular right now, uh, which is what we were talking about, are new work requirements in the bill. This is something that Republicans were pushing for, uh, extended work requirements for social programs like food stamps, uh, like cash welfare, expanding them to go all the way to the age of 54 rather than 49 as they are right now. Young argued that, yes, uh, those work requirements were expanded, but that uh, more individuals were also exempted, uh, including homeless individuals of any age, veterans of any age. So she argued that at the end of the day, uh, it's kind of a wash. We'll see whether that uh, that argument rings true with a number of Democrats, because uh, the House Progressive Caucus major is very large. They cannot afford to lose all of them. Scott McFarland, as you well know, the negotiations were confined to a precious few, but now everyone in Congress, meaning the House, gets a vote and a voice. What are you hearing today? Well, I've heard this deal compared to a Fabergé egg, that it is delicate and that it is fragile. But if so, as this day progressed, it seems like the Fabergé egg is being very gingerly handled and properly protected. There's been no inroads in the whip operation against this bill based on what we've seen this afternoon and as the evening began. There are House Freedom Caucus members who were emphatic that they opposed the bill, saying it doesn't cut nearly enough spending. They had a press conference today. But one of the other opponents, Nancy Mace of South Carolina, says she also doesn't like the size or lack of size of the cuts, but said she's not whipping against it and she thinks it's going to sail right through. I can't find any hard no's demonstrative no's among the Democrats, which leaves the prospect this could be a not-so-narrow margin. Take a listen to two different interviews, one with conservative Earl Buddy Carter of Georgia, the next with Jennifer McClellan, a newly elected Democrat from Richmond, Virginia. Considering the fact that we have the Senate and the White House under Democratic control, I think we did very well. I think this is a good first step. This is not the final product. I mean, we, we are going to, to do more as time goes on. I'm really balancing. Will the final package overall be better for the country and my constituents than a default? And I'll make my decision based on that. So as the negotiations continue backstage, on the stage, there are some protests, but no indication the protests are metastasizing into more no votes. Scott, I want to play for you some sound from an interview I did today for the takeout later this week with Bill Cassidy, Republican senator from Louisiana, about the prospects for this legislation once the Senate takes it up. Let's take a quick listen. 
I think there's going to be some senators who say, okay, we're going to hold it up no matter what. Until Would they be we, in your party in all likelihood? Yeah, of course, because they're trying to have a vote in the process. And, and that's, frankly, how the Constitution structured this. When you hear that, Scott, some Republicans in the Senate may try to stop it at all costs. I should point out that Senator Cassidy also said this will pass by the June 5th deadline or maybe 3 a.m. June 6th. He said the United States will not default, but he was predicting some drama in the Senate. You tend to agree? Yeah, and the Senate Republican leadership echoed that. Senators John Thune and John Cornyn a few moments ago told us they expect this will get the necessary Republican votes to bridge this to passage. The question is now, how much of an appetite or desire is there here for amendments to try to make changes in the Senate after this has already passed the U.S. House? That eats up time, of which there is precious little between now and June 5th. It could skirt things real close to the deadline, maybe even into the deadline by a few hours. But there's a bullishness among Senate Republicans, which is noteworthy, especially among the leadership. And Nancy, from the White House perspective, is it just a matter of timing in the U.S. Senate that they can get the votes, but they just need the proper time agreement to see it through? Uh, that's certainly what they're hoping, Major. And the, the argument that they're making is that, look, uh, of course, there are going to be things that our side doesn't like, that the Republicans don't like. At the end of the day, the main goal was to avert the first ever government default. And this bill does that case closed. Uh, so that is the message that they are pushing. Uh, of course, there are amendments that are already piling up as Democrats and Republicans say, hey, I want to add this to that bill. I want to add, th add that to the bill. Uh, and, and that could create problems if the bill looks different in the House than it does in the Senate. Uh, one of the interesting things that this bill contains is a fast tracking of a natural gas pipeline from West Virginia to Virginia, about 300 miles. It's been gummed up in uh, various environmental concerns and permitting for a long time. And this bill uh, essentially uh, enables it to get all the permits it needs within weeks. But you've got a Democratic Senator, Tim Kaine of Virginia, saying he doesn't like that at all. He doesn't think that this is what the process should look like. He's going to try to introduce an amendment to get that stripped from the bill. So there are uh, potential roadblocks standing in the way, but leadership in both the House and the Senate, as Scott can tell you, is looking to try to steamroll this through uh, so that we don't run into any log jams that could push us beyond that January 5th or much beyond January 6th, because that's when the markets start to get really worried. And one of the co-captains of that steamroller would be none other than West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin, at least when it comes to that pipeline. Nancy Cordes and Scott McFarland, we thank you very, very much.